Uh, we have a great uh, session in store for you today uh, with some of the very top experts. Uh, so we're very thankful for their time today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jerry Williams, and I am the founder and president of Myositis Support and Understanding, um, also known as MSU. And um, thank you for joining us for Myositis Immunosuppressants and COVID Vaccine Response with this highly esteemed panel of physician researchers from Johns Hopkins. So I'm also a patient living with myositis uh, and together with our medical advisor, Dr. Salmon Bai, we will be moderating this very timely and important presentation and question and answer session. Uh, patients directly living with myositis and taking immunosuppressive therapies have submitted a lot of uh, very well-informed questions and we look forward to getting to those after a uh, presentation. Um, so joining us today from Johns Hopkins are doctors Julie Peck, Quilin Connolly, Lisa Christopher Stein, and Dori Segev. And again, from MSU hosting together with me is Dr. Salman Bai. But before we get started, I want to quickly introduce you to myositis support and understanding. Um, we are a continually fast growing, all virtual, all volunteer, patient-centered, patient-led, community-based 501c3 nonprofit organization. And I know that's a lot. So what does all of that mean? It means that with your support, both of financial and with your time, skills, and experiences, that we can keep our organization lean and that we can put all of our contributions uh, so that they benefit myositis patients and caregivers directly. You know, we work to improve the lives of those living with myositis, and we do that through support, education, advocacy, awareness, uh, through our Myositis Patient Financial Assistance Program, uh, which is a needs-based program to help myositis patients with medical bills, uh, assistive and mobility devices, emergency household expenses, and travel to see a myositis specialist. Now, I'm keeping this very brief. Um, I could talk all day about the work that we're doing, um, but since we do have a, a very uh, filled webinar today, I, I just want to keep it brief and say that, you know, please visit our website, understandingmyositis.org, to learn more and register for your free membership so that you can stay updated and get involved. And our work now is also focusing on patient-centered research. Dr. Salmon Bai, who is our medical advisor, is helping to lead the way. And Dr. Bai is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology and Neurotherapeutics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and faculty member at the Institute of Exercise and Environmental Medicine at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital, Dallas. And as medical advisor with us, Dr. Bai is focused on patient, excuse me, patient-centered research, and he's always focused on providing world-class clinical care. And we're so happy to have him joining our family. Dr. Bai, welcome. Thanks, Jerry, for the kind introduction and the plug for patient-centered research. And thank you for the panelists and everyone joining us here today. We've got quite an excellent webinar uh, with world-class experts. And so we'll get into that in just a moment. But just a quick word about MSU. Our goal here is to put patients and their families first in the clinic and in research. Uh, we want patients to not only have access to quality and appropriate care for myositis, but also to steer research agendas. Uh, you and your caregivers have an intimate understanding about the nuances of myositis, and that's valuable and important not only to the clinicians, but to scientists and poly policymakers uh, working with you to bring about change. Uh, MSU is about you, the patient and the caregiver working to heal together. And that's all we need to know about this before we kick off this wonderful talk. Uh, we've got several introductions on the way, so I'll try and keep them short. Uh, Dr. Christopher Stein actually needs no introduction, uh, but I'll try and do my best for her. She's an assist, associate professor of medicine and neurology and is the director of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center, a multidisciplinary clinic formally established in 2007 on the Johns Hopkins Bayview campus, one of the largest, most comprehensive centers in the world. Over the past 14 years, she's been involved in clinical research related to idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, myositis, and has co-authored or authored over 40 publications. She and her colleagues recently discovered this, uh, the statin-related myopathies uh, years back were autoimmune in nature, and that's just an example of the discoveries made uh, with her and through the center 
that are translational in nature, helping to solve medical mysteries and benefiting patients directly. In her role as the attending inpatient consult rheumatologist, she investigates a wide variety of autoimmune rheumatic diseases, including vasculitis, systemic sclerosis, and lupus. She also serves as a member of the Hopkins Institutional Review Board and enjoys teaching both formally and informally at all levels of medical education from students, fellows, faculty. She takes pleasure in this interplay as her role as a clinician, scientist, and educator. Uh, aside from this, she is the kindest, most thoughtful person. Uh, she's a dear mentor, and it's my pleasure to introduce her. Thank you so much, Saman. To Dr. Baha'i, I feel like that's almost longer, that introduction, than the entire webinar. Thanks so very much. What a pleasure it is. I will serve uh, as not only a co-investigator of the study, but more importantly, almost as your MC today. And what a pleasure it is to introduce this panel for which I am so proud to be just a small part of. First is my mentee, friend, and colleague, Dr. Julie Peck. Julie's an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology, of course, at Johns Hopkins, as you've heard. She's also the director of our clinical trials section at the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center. Her research focus is actually an overlap myositis, including those patients with scleroderma and novel therapeutics in refractory dermatomyositis. Dr. Peck has actually led pivotal trials in novel therapies in myositis. Uh, and she has a recent interest in vaccine response in patients with rheumatic diseases, which brought her to the panel today. I think she teaches me as much as I teach her. And I also have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, uh, Dr. Quilin Connolly. She's a current clinical fellow at the Johns Hopkins Division of Rheumatology. And if I certainly had my, uh, uh, my pick, I hope that she will stay forever with us. She graduated with honors from the National University of Ireland in Galloway School of Medicine where she also completed a master's in clinical research. She then went on to complete her internal medicine training at the Osler Medical Residency Program at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Her research interests also include vaccine response as well as cardiovascular disease in patients with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. And because collaborations across medical disciplines can be what I call the secret sauce to really better understanding really critical clinical issues, I am so pleased today to introduce and be joined by Dr. Dori Segev. He is the Marjorie K. and Thomas Osefsky Professor of Surgery and Epidemiology and the Associate Vice Chair of Surgery at Johns Hopkins. He's also the founder and director of the Epidemiology Research Group in Organ Transplantation, which is the largest and most prolific group of its kind in the entire world. With a graduate degree in biostatistics, Dr. Segev focuses on novel statistical and mathematical methods for simulation of medical data, analysis of large healthcare data sets, and outcomes research. He's published in nearly, probably well over, at this point he publishes them daily, I think, 500 peer-reviewed research articles, including those in, that you have, may have seen of surely in the uh, Lancet, in JAMA, in the New England Journal of Medicine. He has innumerable accolades. Uh, in addition, which include a role in mentoring over 100 students, residents, and faculty. He's regularly featured in widely read media like Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. Um, so it was his recent work and those of his colleagues that demonstrated the potential for poor vaccine responses to the COVID vaccine in patients who had undergone solid organ transplantation that really was the nidus uh, and the spark that allowed us to start investigating a similar phenomenon in patients with rheumatic diseases. So with that introduction, I will turn it over to my illustrious colleagues and I look forward to learning along with you. Well, thank you for the <laughs> wonderful introduction, Lisa. Um, and I also wanted to thank um, Jerry and the MSU um, and Salman uh, and the entire MSU community for inviting us to this webinar today. Um, before I start, I also want to emphasize what Lisa said that, you know, while we'll be discussing these important and exciting results, um, this phenomenal, wonderful collaboration with the organ transplant group led by Dr. Dori Saigev was just has been amazing. Without his leadership, I don't think this would have been possible, obviously. Um, and this is a large vaccine response study, and we're just privileged as a team with Quilin, Lisa, and myself to be leading the rheumatic disease arm. And um, I will tell you that so that you don't get bored of my voice, and also I would love to highlight Quilin's 
excellent work thus far and in the future, but she's really been, you know, spearheading this and um, you, we will be switching off. I will be discussing half of the presentation and then she will be discussing the other half and you will see the tremendous work that she did and we all did together, but really without her spearheading this, I don't think it would have been possible. So without further ado, the objectives of today's uh, webinar is first, I'll be discussing the study background and why this study was needed, um, the study design of the vaccine response study, um, and the safety of the COVID, why it's important to study the safety of the COVID-19 vaccines in our patients specifically, and of course our myositis patients. And then lastly, the, the results we found of the antibody response to the COVID-19 vaccines in our patients. So the background, I think this is very important to highlight and why is it important that we study this? It's because if you look at all the studies thus done far, especially the ones that led to the emergency approval of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, the trials, while there were over 40,000, 60,000 patients in it, um, there was less than 1% of our patients in that study. And that's not uncommon, especially when you're looking at it for the first time. But if you look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria, our patients especially would be automatically excluded because they exclude people who have been on immunosuppressants for more than two weeks for the past six months. So I bet many people in this webinar probably would have been immediately excluded. So I think to highlight the first point here that the safety and efficacy of these vaccine trials is very unknown in our patients because they were largely excluded. Second is we know that there is a known reduced response to vaccines in our patients. Um, especially I would like to highlight methotrexate. Um, one of our colleagues, Dr. Jim Park, who worked with us at Hopkins, but now is in Seoul University in Seoul, South Korea, he actually looked at Korean patients and found that patients who are methotrexate, if they held it two weeks um, prior to the influenza shot, they actually had an improved response in the um, uh, influenza titer, the antibody response. So we know that medications like immunosuppressants such as methotrexate can reduce um, vaccine response, including the pneumococcal vaccine. And of course, we can't forget rituximab because it's one of the drugs we commonly use in myositis and, and depletes our B cells, those also reduce the response to the vaccines. Um, so then it goes to, well, what about the mRNA vaccines? These are new vaccines. We don't know anything about it. Um, would that, would immunosuppression also impact mRNA vaccine response? And the last point uh, in this slide that I would like to highlight, because I know there are a lot of patients um, in this webinar is that we understand that our patients could have uh, vaccine hesitancy. You know, it's reported about 50% can have vaccine hesitancy. And it's understandable because I remember learning <laughs> during my training, but also, you know, throughout my patient interactions, we tell our patients to avoid uh, live vaccines if possible, uh, because there is a risk of flare in our patients. And if you have a patient who has lupus, myositis, and we're going to give them a live vaccine, we tell them, you know, there could be a chance of flare. So naturally, our patients have asked us, well, what about these mRNA vaccines? Are they live? Are they not live? As you guys probably all know, because it's so much in the media, it is not a live vaccine, but it makes us understand and highlight that we really need to address um, this vaccine hesitancy concern in our patients for the COVID vaccines as well. Okay, so with that background, the study design included um, patients with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases across the United States. I think the, the epitome and the beauty of this study is that we were able to recruit across the entire United States. And how did that happen? I mean, the vaccines are flying off the shelf, so to speak, right? Uh, but that was possible because of social media. And I think this, all, and also through patient advocacy groups, just like the MS, MSU that Jerry um, ha, has developed, and also more recently through the JH centers, there are centers of excellence. But that was a little bit later because as you all know, during the pandemic, all of our clinics were closed and we were doing telemedicine. So I think this brought to the forefront the power of social media and patient advocacy groups more than ever before. And this really makes me wonder about future studies um, to come. 
Um, outcome measures that we looked at, of course, number one is safety. Are these vaccines safe for our patients with rheumatic diseases? So just like the original Pfizer Moderna vaccine studies that were done on patients without autoimmune diseases, we looked at local and systemic adverse reactions, uh, of course, allergic reactions, any infections, COVID-19 diagnosis, uh, flare events as well, which Lisa was very pivotal in developing the flare uh, questionnaire for this uh, vaccine response study. Um, the second important thing, a very exciting um, outcome measure we looked at was the humoral response or the antibody response. And this is a surrogate measure of response to the vaccine, uh, but this is the best we have thus far. And this is the exact lab test that was done in those big 40,000 patient trials through Pfizer and Moderna. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 entity spike protein antibody that we checked. So what does enrollment look like now? I mean, this is quite impressive. Um, in our arm, there's more than 4,000 patients who have enrolled in this vaccine response study. Um, as you can see the spread in this graph, a lot of the patients are patients who have inflammatory arthritis, lupus, and Sjogren's syndrome, but we still have a group of myositis patients, 285, I think that's amazing. Um, not so much as scleroderma and vasculitis. So to get to the granular data of patients who have myositis, we had 285, as I mentioned previously, and 224 had either polymyositis, dermatomyositis, or immune necrotizing myopathy or necrotizing myositis. 24 had myositis with lupus overlap, um, 20 had myositis with scleroderma overlap, 12 with anti syndetase syndrome, and 5 with IBM. What were the most common treatment uh, regimens that they were on? 30% were on mycophenolate, 15% on methotrexate, 17% on rituximab, 11% on azathioprine. And as you all know, the first uh, three, uh, the first line agents we use, the standard uh, steroid sparing agents we use are mycophenolate, rituximab, and azathioprine. I think that was very well represented in this cohort. 70% uh, rituximab. Um, and 2% uh, tacrolimus, 2% TOFA, and 40% prednisone in mono combination therapy. Um, hydroxychloroquine is not an immunosuppressant, but there were many patients who are on that as well. So the timeline of the vaccine response study, as you can see here, is that once you enroll, as long as you have an RMD diagnosis, you are given multiple questionnaires. Um, and this is where we are very appreciative of the generosity of your time as patients to fill out these questionnaires. Um, and also we accurately try to obtain the vaccine dates. And we have these safety questionnaires embedded at multiple time points um, to capture this data. And here the flare questionnaire I mentioned here is also captured. Below this black line here, uh, we have the, uh, actually, you can see this beautiful vaccine <laughs> that was being given here, and then a post uh, and another dose for the mRNA vaccine. And then the antibody testing um, is done at baseline, post shot one dose, and then post shot the second dose, and then throughout the 12 month period. So, what about the safety? Because that was one of the first outcome measures that I mentioned in our patients. So, the first after the first dose, we looked at what were the reactions that patients had. Um, at that time, when we uh, published this data, we had 325 patients with uh, rheumatic diseases, and we found that 89% had a local reaction, 69% had a systemic reaction, and fortunately, no reports of anaphylaxis and no reports of COVID-19. Um, I think this graph is, uh, is a good representation of what I'm explaining is that this is the overall reaction, 89% of local, and then 69% systemic. But if you look at the more specific data points, you can see that the most common were pain, swelling, and erythema or redness at the site of injection, but they were all very mild, which is the take-home point here. And then for systemic fatigue, headache, myalgia, these were also very mild, which is very reassuring. So the bottom line for the safety component of uh, these COVID vaccines in our specific patients is that we really did not identify any major safety concerns. And the reactions were typically mild. And the most important take-home point would be that the benefits of the vaccine, we believe, uh, outweigh the risks of COVID-19 infection. And just to take a moment here that, you know, patients, my patients, um, everyone's patients <laughs> who have, uh, you know, all of us on the panel, 
if you have a patient who's on, you know, mycophenolate, methotrexate, and they get COVID, I've had patients get very se severely ill. So obviously, I think thinking about my patient who had COVID in that exact scenario, having that vaccination is just so key and making sure that you do not develop a severe outcome. So overall, I think the benefits of the vaccination outweigh the risks of not getting one. So what about the antibody response from the dose one um, in terms of efficacy? Remember we said this was a surrogate measure of the vaccine uh, efficacy. And so we had 123 patients and the antibody was drawn at a median of 22 days post shot one. We had a good representation of overlap connective tissue disease, 35%, 34% of inflammatory arthritis, 24% lupus. Um, at that time, we only had nine patients with myositis, but as you can see, it's exponentially increased. Um, so what did we find? So I think this is a very important point to hone in here is that 74% did have an antibody response, 91 out of the 123. However, this graph highlights something that we did not expect um, from our patients, that patients on mycophenolate had only a 27% response rate, and patients on rituximab only had a 33% response rate. Um, and that is pretty dismal for our patients, because as you can see, mycophenolate is very widely uh, prescribed for our patients. And at the time, I remember, and I'm sure we all did this, but the American College of Rheumatology Vaccination Task Force had a blanket statement that it did not matter that if you were on mycophenolate, you can get the vaccine. It should have no problem. You would have a vaccine response. There's no reason. Um, so those were the, the guidelines. So I, I even distinctly remember telling my patients that. Um, but as you can see here, after the dose one response is, is not very good. Um, so now I will lead into Dr. Connolly's presentation, who will give you more exciting results on the dose two. And um, I think you'll be very excited to hear what we found. So you can take over, Quinlan. Thanks, Dr. Pack. Um, hi, Quillen. thank you. Um, that, that was, very interesting information, and the fact that you can, uh, you know, own up to it, right, uh, and say that that was what I was saying. But because of you guys that are watching today and your participation, we have learned more. So it just validates how important it is for patients to be involved. So thank you, and back to you, Dr. Khan. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I think just to um, jump off of what uh, Julie was talking about, the findings that we, we showed that there was certainly a signal amongst our patients taking mycophenolate um, that they were less likely to develop an antibody response. Um, but the, the rate of 27% of our patients having a positive response was a little bit more encouraging that what, than what was found in the transplant group um, who published this in JAMA. Um, and they found that in 436 patients, only 8% um, of those on mycophenolate had a positive antibody result. And this is just prior to the second dose of um, their, their Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Um, and then just an update um, in our myositis patients. Um, now we have 82 patients with myositis um, and we have data on their antibody response after their first dose. So again, this is just prior to their uh, second dose of Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. And we're seeing that only 55% of these patients have positive antibodies. So 45 out of the 82 have positive antibodies, while 37 out of the 82 do not have detectable antibodies. And I think this is very relevant, uh, pretty for patients who are in this uh, inter-dose period, um, to be aware that they may not have uh, yet developed an immune response to the vaccine. And it's particularly relevant, I think, in countries outside of the US, uh, particularly the EU, where they have now adopted an extended vaccine schedule. Um, so the next thing that we looked at was, uh, we started to look at the dose two humoral response. Um, and you know, we published this paper in 404 patients uh, with rheumatic diseases. Uh, the most common diagnoses were that of inflammatory arthritis and lupus. Um, in this cohort, we had 25 patients with myositis. Um, but that we found overall that the, the results were positive. So 94% of patients had a positive humoral response at a median of about 30 days after their second dose. So overall, very, very encouraging results. 
you know, looking at the rates of seroconversion, um, the, the percentage of people with positive antibodies in, increased from 74% up to 94% after dose two. So, you, you know, very positive again. However, we're seeing in the mycophenolate based regimens, only 73% of the patients had a positive antibody. Um, and then in you know, patients on rituximab based regimens, only 26% of patients had a positive antibody response. So just over one in four patients on rituximab you know, having positive antibodies uh, one month after completion of the two dose mRNA uh, vaccine series. So, you know, again, our results were encouraging and slightly more encouraging than the, the findings in the transplant arm of the group, where they found that only 57% of participants um, had positive antibodies one month after uh, vaccination. Um, and this is updated numbers in 873 solid organ transplant patients um, who were enrolled in the study. And then to update, you know, more myositis specific numbers, we now have 94 patients with the diagnosis of myositis. Um, who've submitted antibody levels one month after completion of Pfizer or Moderna vaccination. And what we're seeing is 79% of our patients have a positive antibody response. So, you know, an improvement from 55% after the first dose, but still there's almost one in five patients who do not have positive antibodies after completing uh, their vaccine series. So we decided that we wanted to really describe the clinical characteristics of patients who did not have evidence of antibody response after vaccination. And we published this case series in the Annals of Internal Medicine, describing 20 patients uh, with rheumatic diseases. So five of these patients had diagnosis of myositis, um, 10 had lupus, three had vasculitis, one with sarcoid, one with Sjogren's. Um, and the things that we saw were that 18 out of the 20 patients were either on mycophenolate or rituximab. Um, and the other, you know, point that we picked up on in these patients was that 16 out of the 20 of them were also on concomitant um, prednisone therapy. Um, and most of these were on very low dose therapy with the median dose of five milligrams. So kind of making us think that Sure, there's a clear signal with mycophenolate and rituximab and absence of response, but could the con concurrent uh, maintenance prednisone also be, be playing a role? Um, so to kind of go through the impact of our findings, you know, it was, this was very much a, a data-free zone um, at the start um, of this study. Uh, thankfully, there's more and more data coming out every single day. Um, but back in early April, uh, the French government released an emergency you know, change in their, their protocol in terms of vaccination, stating that they, wanted, they were going to give a third dose of mRNA vaccine for severely immunocompromised patients. Severely immunocompromised patients being defined as solid organ transplant recipients or patients with autoimmune conditions treated with antimetabolites like mycophenolate or azathioprine or anti-CD20 therapy, such as rituximab. An additional you know, impact of our findings, I think in conjunction with some of um, the other results from other studies in the US, was a change in the recommendation from the American College of Rheumatology pertaining to management of mycophenolate around the time of vaccination. So on April 28th, um, they released a statement uh, recommending that patients on mycophenolate should hold one week of mycophenolate after each dose of vaccination, assuming that the disease is stable, you know, so that the response to vaccination could be enhanced. So limitations to our study, you know, the antibody um, assay that we're using is validated for response to infection as opposed to vaccination. You know, no cutoff titer has been defined uh, to associate with protection. Um, and, you know, predictive models of immune protection are really urgently needed so that, one, we can readily identify those who have not derived sufficient response from the vaccines, but also, you know, to guide future deployment of those who should really be getting uh, booster uh, responses. Um, and then we also didn't assess T cell response. And, you know, there's a clear role of T cell immunity in both fighting COVID-19 infection and also in the response to vaccines. And that's something that we're hoping to define. Um, and then, you know, to kind of put together our findings and conclusions, you know, we've looked at safety data uh, and we've found that the vaccines are safe in patients with rheumatic diseases. 
Um, you know, local and systemic reactions are to be expected, particularly after dose two, but the benefits of vaccination greatly outweigh the risks. Most patients with rheumatic diseases have very robust humoral response to the two dose vaccination series, but we have noticed or we've found that there's a poorer or more limited response in patients on mycophenolate or rituximab based regimens. And these patients really need to be um, aware of these findings and aware of the fact that they may be at ongoing risk of infection despite vaccination, and they should continue to practice preventative measures to mitigate that risk. So future directions of our study, you know, we're very interested in the impact of holding medications in the peri-vaccination period. You know, particularly with mycophenolate, which we've identified as a medication um, that can limit the immune response to um, the vaccine, and how how we would like to quantify, you know, what the impact of holding medication is going to be. You know, we are in this lucky uh, position that a lot of our patients can afford to hold um, doses around the time of the vaccine. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see if this has a substantial effect on the immune response. You know, in the longer term, we want to look at, um, you know, durability of anti antibodies, you know, at months three, six, and 12. Um, and then also to observe in patients who do get additional doses, what the immune response is. Um, and that's kind of the, the end of the, the PowerPoint presentation at this point. And I think we're going to move on to some of the, the questions that were submitted um, by some of the members. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Connolly. Appreciate uh, Dr. Connolly and Dr. Peck. Appreciate your presentations. Um, and I think it's so important. That's why we uh, tried to get this out here as soon as possible, right? Because those implications for those patients are uh, so, so those patients that are on these, um, you know, these two drugs, uh, you know, we're just talking about the importance of it. So patients on those drugs that are not a part of this study, obviously, uh, you need to assume um, that you're, you know, kind of taking the precautions as if you're not vaccinated. Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, we would definitely encourage caution, um, you know, until we have a bit more information exactly what, um, what the immune system is doing. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll lead in to uh, go to the question part of uh, the presentation. And I think this really is probably the meat of uh, what you are all interested in. The questions that have been submitted have largely been collated. There were several themes that emerged, but we'll also try to be sensitive to those that come in in real time to the best of our ability that uh, makes sense to answer in a large forum. First one was I've been on prednisone for close to nine years. Is it safe and beneficial for me to receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, also, we heard I'm nervous about vaccination. Certainly you heard the hesitancy in that. Uh, so we decided to do uh, bullet points, but then also uh, you have the benefit of a live uh, four person crew here to be able to, and, and Dr. Baha'i as well. So you have five physicians on the call who can feel this. We said that we would give you the punchline, which I love here is get vaccinated, smiley face. Uh, it partially, obviously, I think that we've spoken to that, that the risks are outweighed by the benefit. Tell everyone around you to get vaccinated. And with that, I will ask my colleagues to comment further uh, on those points. Yeah, I think um, just to chime in, when we looked at this um, safety, I think I just heard a dog bark, I think. I mean, the, safe, the safety um, results that we think is pretty safe. Um, and um, now the flare data, I think, you know, that is upcoming, so stay tuned. <laughs> uh, but um, I understand uh, patients being nervous about vaccination. I think we will all we were all very nervous. Um, I, I was too. I mean, <laughs> this is a new um, technology, and people are bound to get nervous. But I think what we know is that it's safe for our patients and very beneficial. Um, it is far worse to get COVID. Um, and from a you know physician's perspective, um, it's far worse for me to lose you as a patient um, if you didn't get vaccinated. And that has happened. And I have a patient who's on an immunosuppressant um, and um, did not do very well and passed away. But so I think 
you know, just thinking about the pros and cons, I think definitely get vaccinated. Yeah. Also, one thing I would ask the panelists, any of you can jump into this. Uh, and again, I think this is, uh, we actually had a similar question or, or something similar this morning regarding uh, prednisone use in, or, or corticosteroid use in lupus and the data that's out there. Do you all feel, so the person that wrote in didn't disclose the uh, dose. So is there any thought as to if someone told you they were, I hope they weren't on 40 or 20 milligrams for nine years. If they are, please call us. You might need a doctor. That's a long time to be on that dose of steroids unless you absolutely need it. Uh, but assuming nine years, you've been on some dose of steroids, my guess is it's 10 or under likely for most of those nine years. But what about higher dosing? Or if I get my guess is wrong, and this is a person who has to have had higher steroid dosing for unfortunate reasons. Is there a thought about that? I mean, based on what we know about, you know, high dose steroids, I, I honestly question if, if you were on 80 or 60, I don't even know if the vaccine would work. I mean, most of the vaccine studies, um, you know, they have to be on less than 20. And I think there are a lot of data for that for like influenza and pneumococcal and things like this. But if you're on low dose, like um, Dr. Christopher stated, I, I don't think it should be a problem and it would be beneficial um, in terms of getting an um, antibody response. Are there any other comments from anyone else uh, on the screen that I'm seeing right now? Or, uh, and then I guess also just the other comment is about telling everyone around you to get vaccinated. And I think there are some questions coming in. Hopefully we can get to them about the theme of I'm vaccinated, but I'm worried about those around me not vaccinated. I believe that that's sort of what our, our hope is that you would have to make less um, decisions about masking, unmasking, seeing, not seeing people if we knew that the vast majority, of course, of, of people who, with whom you interacted were indeed vaccinated. Uh, I think that's, that's without saying. I guess we could probably go into math. Oh. No, no that's, that, that was good timing. Yeah. <laughs> good that's time. right. So next, if, if you are fully vaccinated but are immunocompromised, do you still have to wear your mask? All right. This is a hot topic question um, and maybe even one that changes daily. I, I'll actually just introduce this topic again to say, we wanna be clear that we can't make formal recommendations as there really are no specific guidance. Uh, there is no specific guidance just yet. However, we can give you our best estimation of risk based on what we know, but I really leave an asterisk out there. Um, you know, I, I would also please uh, invite um, Dr. Segev and others from the transplant world, what do you think about, uh, I'm sure you get this question every day, uh, should I take my mask off? I'm really afraid, even if, I, even if I know people around me are vaccinated, or maybe even more importantly, if I don't. So um, that is a great question that we are hearing in the transplant side, um, in addition to what you're hearing on your side. And what we've been telling people is that if you are taking immunosuppression medication, so if you are taking medications that purposefully, you know, block or hinder your immune system, then we assume that in some way or another, they are hindering your protective immunity right now. And we have to go with that assumption until we know more. So for the time being, if you are taking immunosuppression medication, what we say is get vaccinated, but act unvaccinated, meaning that don't do, make the maximum that you are, wi are willing to do be the things that the CDC tells you are safe to do for unvaccinated people. Don't do the things that CDC tells you to do that, that is safe for vaccinated people. Do the things that CDC tells you is safe for unvaccinated people until we know better how to measure somebody's protective immunity and how to give them the all clear that you're okay. So that means don't be in indoor situations, you know, without a mask on, et cetera. Follow the same precautions that have kept, kept you safe for the last year and a half until we have more information. And Dr. Segev and others, I, you know, I think that that, I think I've even changed my own thinking uh, to Dr. Peck's point. You know, we're, we're physicians, we uh, learn in real time. When I see a good antibody titer, a good response, my first instinct is, yeah, it's, it's great news. And it is great news. You have some protection. I guess that uh, my question would be, and uh, I'm thinking out loud, but I think this question has come out, 
that do we need a cellular response that perhaps indeed we have uh, can even uh, see evidence of antibody response, but because we haven't effectively and there's no commercialization to date measure T cell or cellular responses, is that the hole in the, in the protection that we don't know about and therefore an antibody response may give us a false sense of security while on immunosuppressives when in fact uh, they may in fact patients in that category may not have full protection that way. Is that true? Yeah, so think of the antibodies maybe as the tip of the immunologic iceberg. So we can measure the antibodies, but under the surface is an extensive B cell, memory B cell, T cell repertoire, T cell activation, T cell metabolomics, all of this complicated stuff that's happening with the immune system under the surface that we cannot measure or quantify right now. So yeah, it, it, you know, having a lot of antibodies is probably better than having no antibodies, but do you have enough of a T-cell repertoire, for example, to work with those antibodies to give you protective immunity? I will say that the fact that we are seeing breakthrough infections in fully vaccinated immunosuppressed people is telling me that there is a problem right? The, the first email that I got from my very, very good friend and colleague, who's not only a transplant surgeon, but also a transplant patient, was an email that said, Houston, we have a problem. And he sent me, you know, his, uh, his uh, antibody results. So I think we, we know that there's a problem because the breakthrough infection rates are higher than we would expect in people with, with fully functioning immune systems. Um, I would say, you know, it's difficult and frustrating to watch everybody else celebrate the fact that they're vaccinated and that life can start to look like it did before the pandemic. And if you're on immunosuppression, it's not quite the right time to do that. I will say that there's hope. We're learning a lot more. Every month we get a tremendous more data on B and T cell immunity and a better understanding of what's going on. Probably in three to six months, we will be able to say, this is your correlate of immune protection that you're looking for. If you meet this correlate, then you can feel more comfortable. But until then, again, this is, I, this is not, unfortunately, sadly, not the time yet for people who take immunosuppression to celebrate the freedom of the vaccines. Very helpful. Are we, yep. So are you recommending repeat vaccination for those who did not initially mount an immune response to the vaccine? So this is a little dangerous territory. We will make no recommendations here. I'll be very clear that we are not recommending something that is not currently, uh, currently we, we clinically make decisions based on preponderance of evidence. This is a live wire question that I'll be daintily handling, handing over to my colleagues, where I think that we have said a variety of things in specific clinical situations. Whoops, I think we'll go back for a second. Uh, but I think this is a very touchy subject and no one's entirely sure. I'll leave that up to the panel to, to comment further. I wonder if um, Dr. Segev, though, and we, um, this was just, came, I'm sure a lot of people saw this in the news <laughs> through CNN or otherwise. And I was wondering if you can just um, talk us through the, this paper uh, briefly um, about the booster um, shots in the transplant patients. Sure. And the paper is available publicly, freely online, has been covered in you know, a lot of the major media networks. And so um, everyone is welcome to go read the paper, see the data in the paper, notice its limitations, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things, as you've mentioned, that is happening right now is somehow people are going and getting third doses of the vaccines. And in our paper, we studied, we run a, a real world observational study. So whatever's going on in the real world, we are studying it. And we studied the first 30 patients that told us that they were getting a third dose and we got their blood before and after that third dose. And we did find some quite encouraging results that we categorize people as negative, low positive, or high positive in terms of their antibody response to the vaccine. These are transplant patients, remember, but so they're patients on a fair amount of immunosuppression. Anyone who started low positive 
got boosted to high positive with a third dose, which is great. And then even of the people who started negative, one third of them showed development of antibodies after a third dose. So that's telling us a couple things. One, there's hope. So even the people who you know, are fretting because they had a poor immune response or a poor antibody response to the vaccine, there's hope that we will be able to do something to improve that immune response. The second thing it's showing us is that negative doesn't mean negative. Remember, we, we're talking about an, you know, the, the, the tip of the iceberg that is the measurable antibodies. So you can have no measurable antibodies and something was still clearly going on in the immune system that primed the patients that had no antibody measurable after two doses to then have some antibody measurable after three doses. It's a reminder of the complexity of all of this stuff. It's a reminder that we have a lot left to learn. We are hopeful that this summer we will be able to start an interventional trial where we can actually provide some patients this. I'm on the transplant side, so this will be um, on the transplant side. We'll be able to provide people third doses in a controlled, standardized setting and really learn what's going on um, with those. I will say if you lived in France you would be getting a third dose right now because the French recommendation is that anybody on immunosuppression gets three doses of the vaccine rather than two. That's one extreme, right? The, the one extreme interpretation of this is, well, everybody should get three doses. The other extreme interpretation is that we shouldn't do anything until we study this very, very, very carefully. We're sort of closer to that in the United States. Um, I will say that, you know, People should be having conversations with their own doctors about how to deal with the vaccination in terms of should you consider holding certain medication for vaccination? Should you consider additional doses for vaccination, et cetera, et cetera? Um, but obviously, the current emergency use authorization is limited to one dose of the, the Janssen platform or two doses of either the Pfizer or Moderna. And so you know, the, the recommendations can never be made beyond that right now. Thanks so much. I'm seeing such fabulous questions in the chat. Jerry, based on our time, and I believe, am I correct that we have until 4.15? Did I, did I get that correct on my time challenge here? Or <laughs> uh, We actually right? have as much time as, as you are available. Uh, well, so we'll be here until midnight maybe, but no, I'm right. here. Great. I, I see some wonderful. Recorded, so it can sure. be much later. <laughs> well, I'm sensitive to everyone's time. I'll, we'll try to be efficient. I do see some uh, wonderful questions, some very specific, but certainly questions I've been asked in the clinic, and I want to try to get to those. So those of you in the chat, stay patient. We'll get to you. Should I get an antibody test? Okay, go. Should they get an antibody test? What does that say? What does that not say? Is it good to have an antibody? Yes. Do we know more about negative antibodies being bad than positive antibodies being good. Uh, and, and I guess I think we've sort of answered some of this, but um, Dr. Connolly or others, what is your thought on, should your patient even get an antibody test? Are we, you know, are we're doing this our, uh, as physicians? What are we really telling our patients? What does that test tell our patients? Well, again, to just emphasize that the antibody testing is validated for response to infection as opposed to vaccination. Um, but it can give you know, some insight into the humoral response or one half of the response of the immune system. Um, so you know, it's up to the, the discretion of your clinician um, to see whether they would you know, feel that a test is warranted. Um, you know, for some of our patients at Hopkins, we are checking in patients in whom we would be concerned um, may not have developed um, an adequate response so that it could possibly inform their you know, decision-making in terms of behavior um, and risk mitigation. Um, however, you know, as, as we're, we've been saying you know, during this Q&A session is that if you're on immunosuppression of, of any sort really, um, that you should be extremely cautious and you know, get vaccinated, but act like you're not vaccinated. Um, so that would be my my overall recommendation. Would the would the team agree that a positive antibody test? So, and there's a question to this extent. A positive antibody test does at least give some degree of hope, recognizing we don't fully understand whether it's enough. But a negative antibody test surely gives us a little bit more information. I, I feel like if one, uh, what I learn more as a physician 
is that a negative antibody test certainly gives me very strong cause for pause, whereas a positive antibody test gives me some degree of hope with some trepidation. Do others sort of support that or? Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree. I think when you see that negative um, test, it's, you know, it's disheartening. Um, but again, it's not the full story, but it informs us that we can have that critical conversation with our patient to say, you really, <laughs> well, you, you're still very high risk. You know, you're not, um, I wouldn't be going to a large event uh, with many people potentially. Um, and maybe patients may, uh, other physicians may feel otherwise, but I think that's the data we have now. And um, that's how we're kind of talking to our patients when we get those results, especially in negative tests. And like Lisa said, if it's positive and it's very high titer, you feel a little bit assured, but it's again, not the full story. Yeah. And, and I think it's a, a good reminder as people are listening to the way you're phrasing these responses in a not black and white kind of way is that these are very um, tricky interpretations right now. There are dozens of antibody tests available out there um, of varying reliability and varying utility. So one should not be getting an antibody test unless it's either one in collaboration with your doctor who tells you which antibody tests to get, and it's an antibody test that your doctor has familiarity with and can help you make an interpretation, or two, in the context of a research study. I think those are the two contexts where um, it is reasonable to get an antibody test. Um, otherwise, I think, um, and, and I, I said this in, some, in one of the media interviews, otherwise I think it will cause more chaos than, um, than be helpful if these are being done sort of without um, interaction with either a physician or a research team. Very I wise think advice. that's so important. Oh, sorry, Dr. Lisa. I no, just, I just said it's wise advice. Please jump in, Jerry. Yes, and we're, and we're seeing that in the uh, in our support groups. You know, we're talking about that with patients, and they're, that's one of the big questions is, you know, should, you know, my doctor didn't do an antibody test, and, you know, I need them to do an antibody test. So, so it's really, you know, it's really good to have this, you know, outside of a research study or as long as your doctor understands and can help like, uh, Dr. Sagev said, help you interpretate that, but still <clears throat> you're going to, you know, be taking uh, some of the most, um, the same precautions as though you were unvaccinated anyway. So I think that's uh, really great. Thank you. And Dr. Lisa, back to you. I think we'll go to the next question. I just, I, I'm sensitive to the time. Let's go. Do you have any results regarding uh, the immune response in those with myositis who are taking only methotrexate? So we do. Uh, and uh, Dr. Connolly, I think you can probably just reiterate some of that. I think you saw some of that earlier data, but would you? Yeah, and I think, that? you know, the re results uh, pertaining to methotrexate have been very encouraging. You know, prior to, you know, studying this, I think a lot of rheumatologists were very concerned about methotrexate because of the data um, pertain relating to, you know, influenza and pneumococcal vaccines, um, that there is a reduced response in, with those two vaccines. But what we're seeing, and it's being um, replicated in other studies, is that patients on methotrexate seem to be responding very well. I think we can move on. I think it's pretty much that. That's, a, that's, a, that's an easier one, I think. Ooh, whoops, one. Whoa. When do you expect? <laughs> when do you expect to see the COVID-19 antibodies in the IVIG? Ah, so when will we see passive transfer of COVID-19 antibodies? How much protection will that offer? All right, so one, also I just wanna piggyback that onto a question I believe that came through the chat that said, how protected am I on if, I, I, if I'm taking IVIG? So I, I think this is, the question is, what is the data with regard to IVIG? So IVIG itself is currently not thought to be protective but IVIG is an immunomodulator, not an immunosuppressor. And therefore we do not expect nor have seen patients who are, t who are on IVIG therapy to be truly immunosuppressed. That changes if you're on combination therapy with other immunosuppressants. And uh, with that, I'll let my colleagues answer uh, with this little bullet that says soon, this will increase as rates of vaccination increase, of course. So let's talk more about that to my team. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. I think it's funny because I think we had this discussion in our myositis research meeting that 
probably, you know, six months from now, everybody's going to be vaccinated and the people are donating immunoglobulins. Um, those immunoglobulins are coming to our patients, so they probably will have some passive transfer. Um, and I think that's why they actually excluded in the initial Pfizer study anybody on IVIG potentially, if you look at the exclusion criteria. Um, anyway, so I, I would like to um, uh, highlight that IVIG, again, is not at immunosuppressant. I have many patients on IVIG who have received the vaccine, and we have checked antibody titers um, who, uh, who have had excellent responses, although, again, the antibody response is not completely the whole picture. Um, but if you are on combination therapy, like Lisa said, I think that would be a very um, um, a concerning role of the other immunosuppressant because IVIG is not an immunosuppressant. Um, anything else? How much protection will that offer? Oh, we don't know, but um, <laughs> hopefully coming soon. Anyone else for this one? Uh, I think that's a TBD. All right, I, I, I'd like to rapid fire if that's okay with uh, you, Jerry and Dr. Baha'i and the, and the team. Um, I, the next question is, were any patients with LGLL, LGLL is large granular lymphocytic leukemia and, and uh, sporadic IBM in the study. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump in to say that I don't think we know because we didn't ask, but uh, maybe back me up if I'm wrong, uh, Drs. Peck or Connolly, I don't believe that we know that answer. Um, we have five patients with IBM. But not knowing the LGLL status, correct? Mm -hmm. I would think we would not know that because we did not ask it. Yeah, we correct? don't know that. Yeah, yeah and I, I would say just from uh, any patients in which our own patients whom we know have enrolled in the study, I can't say that I can think of one that I'm aware of that has that combination. So I think that's no. Who made the recommendation on April 28th that Michael Fenelet should be held off for one week after the vaccine? Should or should not? Um, so go ahead. That was the American College of Rheumatology. You know, they developed a task force um, relating to, you know, COVID-19 guidance management of medications around the time of vaccine vaccination. Um, their, you know, version one, uh, which they released, you know, earlier in the year, um, and I think it was February time, recommended, recommended continuation of mycophenolate, but some adjustment of other medications, including methotrexate and um, abatacept or Arensia. Um, and then they adjusted their recommendations on the 28th of April, recommending that all patients on mycophenolate, as long as their disease was stable, um, and it was safe to do so, that these patients would hold one week of mycophenolate after each vaccine dose. And the reason, I guess people would ask, you know, why didn't they say this to begin with? The task force that was assembled was utilizing data that they had based on eminence-based, you know, data that was uh, extrapolated from the best of their ability and not necessarily knowing anything about how COVID-19 vaccination would, would play out in the, um, in the in an immunosuppressed patient population. So I know it can be frustrating from a patient standpoint to say, wait, you said this, now you say that. This body says this, now they say that. Don't, don't people know what they're talking about? The answer is that we learn in real time. That's not right, the earth was, was once flat and now it's round. And similarly, you know, first we didn't hold and now we do. And I think that we get better. And to Jerry's point, I cannot stress enough that we got better because of patients like you who are willing to volunteer to do these kind of studies so that we could learn and make better recommendations. We have not discussed the J&J &J vaccine. I think we briefly mentioned it. I think Dr. Seget briefly mentioned that. What about antibody production for those who have only had that vaccination? Anyone wanna take this one? Um, so we have a much smaller sample of patients who've received the J&J. &J, and I think that was largely in part because um, you know, there was that temporary pause on people getting the J&J &J, um, vaccine. Um, and that's you know, data that we're, we're currently analyzing at the moment and we'll be happy to share with you once we have the results. In, uh, in the transplant population, we have found lower antibody response to the J&J &J compared to the mRNA vaccines. Probably a combination that this is only one dose. People who are immunosuppressed might need you know, the sort of natural um, boosting that comes with um, priming with one dose and then boosting with a second dose, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in a small number of transplant patients, we have published that the antibody response is lower with the J&J &J for whatever that means. Thank you. 
So the next uh, question comes in to say, I've been vaccinated, but I'm still worried about those around me who are not. What are your suggestions for patients who work directly with a high flow of customers, for example? Thoughts there and recommendations on practicality about recommending what they do and how they navigate their career and their lives when they're, you know, essentially may be required to be among many people who are potentially unvaccinated. I, I think um, if you're on an immunosuppressant, I would definitely wear the mask and still be very vigilant about, um, you know, washing hands and things like this, especially because if you're in a workplace where you're encountering a lot of people, I always say <laughs> it's not like they have a vaccine card on their forehead. So um, I would definitely be extremely vigilant. And if I were you, I would wear a mask, but I mean, certainly talk to your physician about it as well. I think the example of Dr. Segev explaining sort of to the extent that if one is, you know, there are people who choose for whatever reason, to remain or to continue to be unvaccinated, I think that there is some obligatory behavior that should go along with that decision. And obviously sometimes it's for your own safety and those around you, but having that, I think that's a wonderful suggestion to think about the CD, not easy, but the CDC rules for unvaccinated individuals living in that sphere, I think really does. I think that's an excellent suggestion to sort of help guide where your risk tolerance may need to be. There are several questions about rituximab, which I think are very important. And again, uh, th this, is, this is a hot topic. So I, there are two questions that are similar. I'll read the first, and I believe there's a very similar one coming up. Hi, I've been on rituxan, uh, rituximab every four months for two years. I know it's cumulative, so I put off my infusion to wait until at least six months out from my last infusion to hopefully have a better chance for it to produce antibodies uh, is that long enough or should I wait longer? A very similar question is, I've been told about the vaccination uh, timing with regard to rituximab. I'm gonna try to find that one. Uh, essentially, should it be, uh, should I get vaccinated right before I'm going to receive my next dose? Should it be 30 days before, 60 days? So I think the, the big question or the big umbrella is, how do we navigate rituximab? Can you clarify timing? What, yeah, so here's, I was told, so I need to, I need clarity on the timing of getting the vaccine and getting the next rituximab dosage. I was told 30 days before the next dosage and with the vaccine being at least a uh, 30 something process, would it be, would it be 60 days before rituximab dosing? That's a lot of questions around rituximab. Again, I think this rituximab is a tough, a tough one. Maybe I'll, I'll shoot that to Dr. Maybe Dr. Connolly, not to put you on the spot. I know you've thought a lot about rituximab and how we're if we can do anything to maximize response there, and also to Dr. Peck, we we've, we we stay up late at night talking about this very question. So I'll I'll leave that in your hands. Um, so you know, I think I you know uh, I don't think we have an answer uh, really at this point in time. Um, what I will say is that it's unsurprising, you know, that patients are not having an antibody response because the way rituximab works is it wipes out your B cells, and B cells make antibodies. What we really need to figure out is, is there T cell activity in, you know, patients who are on rituximab who don't have positive antibodies? There was a very small study, you know, I think it was only six or eight patients on rituximab who didn't have a positive antibody response, but did have evidence of cellular or T cell response. So that's encouraging. So I would definitely recommend that patients still get vaccinated. Um, the American College of Rheumatology guidance is that there is a, a four week gap, you know, you either get vaccinated, complete your vaccine series four weeks prior to your next infusion, or at least four weeks after um, your infusion, you can start the series. Um, so I think that's the minimum amount of time you would like to leave. Um, but I would still certainly get vaccinated because there is a, a chance that you, you are having a benefit on the cellular side of things that we have not yet captured. I think that just to piggyback on that, I would say that if I had the choice or if you if you pushed me as your patient to say what to do, again, it, it may be a false sense of security. And I think rituximab, as Dr. Connolly has suggested, it has, it has actually, as you know, a very durable uh, lowering of B cells in some, in some patients for years, even mm -hmm. with one dose. 
So I think this is variable, but if I had my druthers and you pushed me, I'd feel much more comfortable if you completed your vaccination series before you got your next rituximab and as far out as you could push your rituximab. We do have the benefit, unlike the transplant patients, as was stated, in, in solid organ transplantation, I, I, I believe this has to be true, that there's not as much wiggle room, if any, to be able to ever hold immune suppression. We do have the benefit of a more sliding scale and rituximab is something that some people can actually hold for longer than an indicated. Sometimes we give it at every six months, but there's been no flare. And it's just something that we're, where we do this because it seems to keep the di disease at bay. But had we held that, the disease would not have flared. So I think, again, individualizing that with your physician, if you are a person who can hold that dose as long as possible and get finish your vaccine uh, series at least one month prior to rituximab infusion, personally, I think that that's, that's ideal. But again, I think it's situational dependent upon each individual um, person. So I want to make a comment. Um, I think to play devil's advocate, yes, okay, we're talking about COVID and rituximab is one of the worst offenders. But I do have patients where, um, you know, that was the only drug that controlled their disease. So I think you really need to have a very, uh, very, very educated, hopefully long conversation with your physician. If you're flaring and you need that rituximab, I mean, would you really wait? Um, that's the big question I think that has come up with my patients. Um, yes, I know that ultimately, if you are going to get rituximab, please try to get the vaccine beforehand. But again, I have patients who had one dose of rituximab one year ago, and she does not have a response. So it's very variable. And just to mention with uh, what Quilin um, had presented uh, the data on the patients in the annals of internal medicine, I think the median dose, uh, the time of the rituximab was like up to nine months. It wasn't just six months. Um, so I think Yes, I think it's a very difficult conversation because I have very well-controlled patients on rituximab who, you know, do not want to wait because their risk of flare and they do not want to be hospitalized if they flare. So I think it's a very difficult conversation to have, but if you can, and you're very stable, then it would definitely uh, wait um, to get the vaccine. Great clarification for sure. Absolutely. It's a risk benefit discussion always. What are your thoughts on returning to the workplace where others are not being required to mask and or social distance? Again, I think this theme has probably been discussed. Again, assuming the risks are higher to you. Some people, uh, I will say in my personal experience, some of my patients have asked for a letter uh, to ask them to, to allow them to continue remote work and stating that they may be in a higher risk category, even if vaccinated. And I think to the discussion today, one could uh, make that argument. Physicians could write on their behalf if it were something that uh, you were eligible for telework in which uh, a doctor could stipulate that indeed there may be a higher risk to you merely by being on immunosuppression. If you must return to work, I think again, I, the, the theme and the, uh, those others can chime in is indeed to just continue to be vigilant. Yes, I think just being vigilant is very important. Yep. Uh, now that others are unmasking, is my mask enough to protect me in a close contact situation? So I think it depends on who you're in contact with. And once again, uh, to just harp on that same theme, y even vaccinated while we have hope, and yes, it's definitely encouraging if we know something about your antibody response, or if you're on minimum immunosuppression and have responded, uh, that makes us feel better, but we don't want to get too comfortable until we know a little bit more. I'm flying across the country for my son's wedding this weekend. I'm scared to death. I have dermatomyositis and I'm fully vaccinated. I know my antibody titer is positive, 112. I will <laughs> mask as much as possible, but I still feel this is very risky. Is it? I feel, Rebecca, like you've just asked us a board question. Okay, so for, <laughs> for the team. What would you tell this patient? Is it risky? What do we tell her? So I think any travel on an airplane could be risky. Um, it's funny that you asked that because I myself will be traveling and I had this conversation in my head with Lisa multiple times, in my head and with Lisa. Um, but I think it's always the risk benefit. I mean, this is a wedding. And um, I mean, if you have, you know, if you're going to fly and you bought the tickets, you just have to be vigilant again um, to wear the mask and do extra protective 
you know, uh, measures if you um, don't have an antibody response. But again, it's not the whole story. I think we have to, you know, reiterate that again, the antibody uh, test being positive is not the whole story, but it makes you feel a little bit better that when you are flying that if you had to compare yourself to someone who had absolutely zero antibody response, you're probably in a better place. Um, but um, you just have to be very careful. <laughs> I'll also just play devil's advocate to that. And to Dr. Pack has herself been very <laughs> reluctant to get on an airplane. Uh, I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not pushing air travel, but even in the uh, height of the, you know, COVID in which we, when we had a completely unvaccinated population, interestingly enough, and granted there were fewer flying, but th there, there was not a lot of data suggesting that air travel was the uh, place where people were getting infected. It was indoor dining. It was gyms, it was bars. And so that is still likely. Um, absolutely mask. Go see your son. I, uh, I, think that your, I think that your immune system is probably going to be at, under greater attack from the stress of flying than the actual flight. <laughs> so I, 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 will, I will think that I would yeah. go to my son's wedding. Yeah. yeah son's when wedding. I saw my rheumatologist, he said he'd need one year of data to tell me more about the vaccine because he can't know more. Is this information getting pushed out to these specialists? Um, I, I don't know exactly sure I understand the sentiment of that, but maybe the sense is that just like us, we're not exactly sure what to recommend because we need data. I don't know that it's going to be a year, but I do think it's going to take some time just to uh, you know, speak to the rest of the panelists uh, that we need to understand more about cellular immunity through the T cells. Remember your white blood cells are B and T cells. You hear a lot about these letters, but those are the differences there. So I think that, yes, we push it out as soon as we can. Um, I thought the mask was mostly to prevent me from spreading infection to someone else. How effective is the mask in protecting patients from the, from the unvaccinated? I, I think we've, and you're, you're, you are correct to some extent. I think the reason that masking was not originally recommended was exactly this. We didn't recognize the um, airborne nature of the disease and such. And there is definitely protection in both directions. And as more people are vaccinated or, and, and those around remain unvaccinated or insufficiently vaccinated, that mask becomes a greater level of protection um, is what I would say. I don't know if others have other thoughts to that. How effective? No. Uh, what future role will the new variants that seem to be entering the picture have in all of this? Do we need a third booster, pre-vaccination rules, et cetera? Thoughts on variants to the team? You know, I think uh, the data on variants is obviously very topical in the media at the moment. Um, you know, I think the recommendations would be, you know, get vaccinated, encourage those around you to get vaccinated and continue to, to be vigilant. Uh, thank you for, is that true? Uh, Dr. Pack, anything else to add there? No, I don't think so. I think we just, um, we don't know a whole lot yet. Um, there have been rumors um, that everyone will need a booster, but hopefully not. <laughs> no. So I don't think we know. I don't think we know. So for now, I think, you know, you really want to get vaccinated. I completely agree with Dr. Connolly. All right. I think in the interest of time, we really are at the end of the time yeah. limit. I'll try to just, uh, uh, there are a few more. And those that we couldn't get to, uh, Dr. Or Jerry, <laughs> Dr. Jerry, Jerry is so good at uh, collating questions for us that we can always answer and he'll put up on the website. Those of you who have thanked us for the webinar and asked that the presentation be uh, shared, I believe that Jerry will certainly give you information on how that can be done. And I think with that, we should probably truncate this, but we're happy there are about eight questions or so, unfortunately, in the interest of time, we did not get to, but we are happy to try to provide summative answers to these questions, if that's okay with you, Jerry, and provide it on the website like we've done in the past. Yes, absolutely. I certainly appreciate that. And I know that everybody else will uh, as well. This, uh, again, has been recorded. Um, I do kind of go in and make uh, some edits to kind of make it more, you know, flow, uh, but it will be available in about uh, one to two days or so. Um, and we'll share that obviously on social media and it'll be on our website and emails and all the wonderful places. Thank you so much. I hope that it was uh, helpful to you. The dog yes. seems like he agreed. I know the dog. <laughs> My dogs. I'm sorry. I, no, I, 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 I get a dog. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I have the cicadas and the tree cutter. You have the dogs. It's all in the world of Zoom, Jerry. We're we're very familiar with navigating yeah. virtual world these days. So. <laughs> right. Thank you so right. much for having us. Thank you very oh. much. We're so grateful and hope that your patients and our patients will benefit from uh, this discussion. I think more to, to be determined, but I'm hoping it was helpful to answer some maybe unanswered questions and to provide a little bit more of an umbrella of information for what we know today. Yes, and that's what that's what's so important about today is, you know, that we just want to, you know, stay informed as we move through this together with you. And we appreciate uh, your time today and all the time that you put in uh, to preparing the presentation and answering all those wonderful pre-submitted questions. So Dr. Pack, Dr. Connolly, Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein, um, everybody else kind of had to run. So it's just, it's just us, but uh, I wanted to, to say thank you to you, uh, each of you, and uh, we do appreciate it. And is there uh, anybody that's looking to maybe participate in this study? Is it still ongoing and how can they do so? Um, so I think, you know, we've had such a, a wonderful uh, response and enrollment, um, you know, with over 4,000 patients at this point. Um, we're targeting just enrollment to patients who are on um, either mycophenolate, tacrolimus, or rituximab, um, and trying to catch them within 30 days after completing their vaccine series. So, you know, within, within the first month um, after getting their second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, or within the first month after getting their J&J &J shot. Um, so they're the kind of the entry criteria um, at this point in time, because we've We've gotten such a great response. Uh, we have to shout stop at some point. Those particular groups are of interest and I think you get screened to tell you whether or not you can still enroll. So absolutely stay tuned. And again, thank you to, uh, to the patients uh, on this call and all of you who have really helped us learn in real time. I think we learned together, we're a team and uh, MSU is such a great example of how to make that happen. Thanks to Jen and to Jerry and Lynn uh, and to the entire team today. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we look forward to uh, upcoming uh, new data. So keep us informed. And, and we really, again, appreciate your time. And if um, anybody, uh, again, the questions we will send over and we will post those. And looks like my head's being cut off here. Uh, <laughs> So uh, if, again, uh, for everybody attending, if you have not yet registered to uh, join us uh, as a member of MSU, visit our website, understandingmyositis.org. And if you are blessed financially, uh, donations are always welcome. That's how we move uh, our work forward here at MSU uh, as an all virtual and all volunteer organization so that we can help improve the lives of those living with myositis. So thank you all for your time. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again really soon. Thank you. Thank you.